Thank you very much for joining us for this important panel and moderated discussion on the legacies of Indian bondage. I am Michelle Delaney, Assistant Director for History and Culture at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. Your moderator for this panel, and also a member of the Smithsonian team that organized the program for this virtual symposium, The Other Slavery, Histories of Indian Bondage from New Spain to the Southwestern United States. This is presented by the Smithsonian Latino Center, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture, as part of the Smithsonian's new Our Shared Future Reckoning with Our Racial Past initiative. Today's panel presentation and moderated conversation will explore the legacies of Indian slavery today, from weakened cultural grounding to forced removals. Topics will include intergenerational trauma and public health, including the effects of COVID-19 on Native communities. This conversation will also touch on how museums can further discussions on slavery in the United States, including decolonizing perspectives. We are joined today by five expert panelists, community leaders, and museum scholars who present their varied perspectives on the legacies of slavery in their communities or institutions. Each speaker will present for about 10 minutes, and then we will all come together for questions and the moderated discussion. The panelists for Legacies of Indian Bondage are the Honorable Brian D. Vio, Governor of the Pueblo Acoma, Mary Elliott, Curator of American Slavery at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Vanielle Blackhorse from the Navajo Nation, and Roylene Ross, Cultural Psychologist and Consultant, and Brandy McDonald, Director of Decolonizing Initiatives for the San Diego Museum of Us. Longer biographies are available on the web landing page for the Other Slavery Symposium. And you can find that for all participants for the symposium. So let's get started with the panel presentations. It's time for me to introduce our first presenter, Governor Vio. Governor Vio is a leader and member of the Pueblo of Acoma tribe in New Mexico. He has worked in cultural resources management museum development and tourism. A former director of the Indian Arts Research Center in Santa Fe, the governor is also a self-taught painter and potter. He will now share his perspectives and work on the legacies of slavery. Governor? Good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy to be with all of you today. Uh, as uh, has already been said, I am Brian Vio and I'm the governor at the Pueblo of Acoma here in New Mexico. Uh, I am serving a third consecutive term as governor and uh, am appointed to this position by the hierarchy of our clan system. So I want to just take some time to talk about a couple of concepts. And you know, when uh, this topic was presented to me initially, I gave some thought and also had a conversation with my father, uh, who also served as governor a few years back, um, and also reached out to a couple of, of elders uh, to ask about just terminology. And um, what I was most interested in knowing was, because I couldn't recall the word or words to uh, descriptive words myself, but to to arrive at a um, or and know what the words were, uh, Akama words were for slavery or slave. And fortunately, there really isn't a word uh, for slave or slavery in our own indigenous language. Um, however, with European contact and the um, the impacts of that contact on our people, there were terms that evolved, um, really became descriptors for uh, what our ancestors were experiencing and what they saw for the first time 
in their their living history of this taking of people and witnessing this this concept of of slavery um and uh really a belittlement of um of a human being and thankfully we don't re- use this terminology uh in our everyday language you know but um those descriptors are um quite profound i would say because again it is uh the words are are such that you know we are talking about uh, humiliation we are talking about suffering we are talking about freedom or the ta- the taking away of of freedom and um really diminishing the spirit of the individual and so those akama terms or those akama words um you know when they're pieced together to make reference to slave and slavery it's it's just it, it it's 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 a it's scary and it um uh i i just am grateful that we don't you know need to use these words in our in our daily language but what i you know what i also want to um uh, share with you folks this afternoon is the kind of the end of this intergenerational trauma then that we um as indigenous people um are unfortunately you know dealing with in this time and what i want to address specifically is you know as a tribal leader you know we have then the responsibility to to respond to acknowledge and respond to this this on, uh, continued trauma and to understand the trauma and also uh, you know just uh, develop our own internal strategies for addressing um the trauma that has been experienced by our people and that continues today of course it's uh, a different time in our living history but still these these um uh these issues exist and and they linger and um one of the things that i want to um say is that uh you know 30 years ago i was a first appointed uh, as a tribal official i served as a lieutenant governor 30 years ago and when i was appointed in 2019 as the, the governor i was so taken aback by the fact that uh during some of the initial consultations that were held between federal agencies and our tribe is that the same questions that were being asked 30 years prior or at that time it was 28 years prior were the same questions asked that 28 years ago the process changed a little bit um there were certainly different individuals asking the questions but the the consultation this federal mandate for consultation remained really meaningless and i didn't i didn't understand that and i i i it i was just dumbfounded by the by that fact that some agencies were still had not um uh achieved a level of consultation that was one meaningful but also a process that uh, then engaged native american people in this country in dis- the decision making process but it, be- it became very apparent that federal policy and in some cases state policies around consultation uh have not changed much and in fact in some cases they have um been a detriment and have and contribute to this uh ongoing trauma that we exist that exists and that we experience as um indigenous peoples in this country but one of the things that i i was um you know just so i guess disappointed in is the fact that you know the um 
the tribes in this country have worked very hard to uh, maintain a seat at the table and 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 you know ensure that consultation happens um, where the repatriation of our ancestors, their associated funerary items, and items of cultural patrimony are concerned. All of these things, which are covered by the federal uh, law called NAGPRA or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, but one of the issues that I um, was uh, inherited from my predecessor was um, the working towards uh, bringing back to Akama a ceremonial shield that became uh, was up for auction in, in a uh, auction house in Paris. And again, here, I was just taken aback by the fact that, you know, um, uh, through the uh, UNESCO declaration, um, there is a um, opportunity for the United States as a partner um, with other countries to work together to repatriate ancestors and other items back to their respective uh, places of origin. And the United States, while it is a signator to this uh, international policy, did not have the mechanism in place or had not committed to establish the mechanism that was, would be required to, to achieve and be an active participant and beneficiary of that uh, agreement. And one of the other things that I inherited from my predecessor is you know, the um, uh, development and um, uh, ho hopefully soon passage of another federal law called the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony legislation, which would address the ongoing illegal trafficking of these very types of materials that continue to leave this country. And so, you know, all of this was, you know, coming to really just boiling and brewing. And I, uh, I just didn't understand why the federal government was um, either not interested or unwilling to acknowledge that they have a place in this process. So, you know, when I reflect on the, these, these Akama concepts, that I mentioned earlier, in this time, we are on some level still experiencing slavery. That through the acts, acts of the federal government and others, we do not have the same freedoms we are not afforded the, um, the same privileges. There's no equity. And it's, it's very disheartening. Even just yesterday in the state of New Mexico, we as tribal leaders are, uh, and there's a lot of press right now on, on this issue, dealing with a situation here in the state of New Mexico where as a result of just outright racism within our state government, the education, the educational opportunities for our Native American children is compromised because of an, a state official who has the, apparently has the, the right and the privilege to continue serving in their respective capacity, even while this individual has made some very derogatory and racist comments against Native American uh, tribes and, and people in this state. You know, just when you think you're making some really good progress around policy and um, strengthening government-to-government -government relations, whether it be at the federal level or the state level. It's very apparent that there's so much to do. 
And so as I was thinking of those concepts again, those Akama terms and, and concepts around slavery and a, a slave, I, I said earlier that even while we don't, and thankfully we don't have to use these terms in our, in our daily language, those terms are real and they are damaging and they do not provide for equity and access just as they would they do for others in this country and and in other places in the world so during this time of healing and recovery uh you know we're still in a pandemic We've learned a lot from this ex this experience, but we we have to really think critically about this recovery and healing process, and really take as Native American people and Indigenous peoples of this world assert our sovereignty and do all that we can to ensure that we are uh, at the table and that we uh, have the opportunities to shape policy, to change the narrative, and to have impact in, in the, the recovery of, of, our, 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 of this world, of this earth. So I you know, want to say that at the Pueblo of Akama, as we continue to respond to the pandemic, and uh, you know, we were we did a good we did a good job, I think, uh, during um, COVID. We worked very hard to ensure that we would reach herd immunity, which we did about two months ago, and continue to do all that we can as a government to ensure that our community is safe. And we were. We were COVID case free for just over four months until last week when we had two breakthrough cases of the Delta variant. So there's, there is so much at stake and our creator has presented us with quite the challenge, uh, another challenge, but we'll get through this. We, we will, we will survive. And I, I have to say that this experience that we've all had and that my community members uh, have unfortunately have had to endure has made us stronger. And I look forward to the days ahead when we can address this bondage remove the bondage and be recognized as contributors and as human beings, part of humanity by leaders in on the federal level here in this country but it will take some work. And I, I, I just want to say that I, um, I join other tribal leaders throughout the country, all who have worked so hard and continue to make great sacrifices to protect our people, our land and resources, but to also have an impact uh, and you know, bring down these barriers um, so that our children and generations of our native people yet to come will no longer have to refer and know of what slavery and bondage and humiliation are. So I, with that, I, I will say thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Now I will introduce Mary Elliott, Curator of American Slavery at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. 
Mary is an author, an editor, a lawyer, with personal research interests related to the antebellum slavery, Reconstruction, and African Americans in Indian Territory. She has also served as an editor on the influential New York Times 1619 Project. Mary will now share her work connecting with Indian slavery. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this very important conversation. Um, it's my pleasure to share this presentation on a shared history and a human rights story. So this is the museum where I work, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And while we look at African American history and culture, as I said, this is a shared history and it truly is a human rights story looking at the story of the other slavery. We consider our colonial connections. And I think about in the 1440s when Portugal travels down into West Africa and starts to engage in the slave trade. By 1452, the language of a papal bull, an edict from Pope Nicholas V, which states, and I'm going to um, take out a few words, but it essentially says um, that under apostolic authority, the Portuguese were given the right to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens and pagans and any other unbelievers, as well as to seize their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and reduce their persons to perpetual servitude. It gives you pause, doesn't it? Because it makes you think about all that starts from enslavement, bondage, colonization, and how all of us in these marginalized communities were caught up in this, this notion of greed. And so you see the impacts of slavery in along that West African coastline where there's trade going on, but you see the impacts of colonization in the Western Atlantic world. And it is imperative that people understand that slavery was not limited to people of African descent. And to understand where these two groups, people of African descent and native people come together and where there are tensions. Here I have images that I wanted to share. And unfortunately we have to rely on images that were drawn by people of European descent. So I have this image um, and it has these stereotypical names, savages of many nations in Louisiana from 1735. Then there's a scene at the bottom of market people in Louisiana in 1819 done by Henry Latrobe. And in that scene, you see people of various backgrounds and it really speaks to the fluidity of that early period of colonial North America. But then you see an image to the right, the black and white image, and that's the image of the burning of Jamestown, which was a drawing done by Howard Powell. Burning of Jamestown makes us think about the um, Bacon's Rebellion. And Bacon's Rebellion, we discuss in the museum from the perspective of an alliance of free and enslaved people of African descent, poor white people, yeoman white farmers. And it's a band of people that were brought together by a man named Nathaniel Bacon. At the heart of Nathaniel Bacon's um, plight was the issue of wanting further support from the local government to fight against native people. And so we have to keep in mind all these different areas where we connect and different choices people made that have an impact on one another. As we move forward to alliances and forced migrations, I think of migration by choice, forced migration, and I think about the Seminole Wars and the alliances of the Seminole and of Black people in Florida, and fighting essentially for survival, for freedom. Um, but then you see this image below on Manifest Destiny. And when we think about Manifest Destiny and this notion of opening up the nation and spreading that wealth and power further west, but at whose cost? And at whose cost is the cost of the native people who occupied this land? 
and who were also held in bondage, who were held for purposes of economic power, greed, at the same time that people of African descent were. And we think about there these alliances, but we have to think about how each person, each group, was manipulated to advance this nation's prosperity and political power. And so you see the movement of people, the forced migration of people west in order to spread economic power through the cultivation of cotton, sugar, rice, and that economic power was supported by the forced bondage of both native people and black people. To the right, you see this image of a coffle of enslaved African-Americans forced to the deep South following that 1830 migration. And then we come to fighting for freedom. Both groups, African-Americans, native people fighting for freedom. Here we have this image of John Ross, the chief of the Cherokee Nation, who fought against that forced migration with the um, Trail of Tears. Yet the complexity of it is that he also owned enslaved Black people. And in the center, we have this image of an early image of African-Americans cultivating cotton in 1850 after that Trail of Tears. And it gives that sense of understanding that people were moved out of the way again for the economic power of the nation. But then you see, without painting a broad stroke, so often um, we'll hear where African-Americans might say, native people owned enslaved people as well. At the same time, native people fought both, yes, for the Confederacy, but also for the Union Army side. And so we cannot deny that. We are not, none of us are monolithic and we made choices. And then as we move forward, we see some of those choices are even being made by black people. So you see where African-American men in the 1890s are fighting as Buffalo soldiers as a way to push for their rights, to push for equality. They're serving as Buffalo soldiers, which puts them against native people. And then they're serving, carrying out their duty in Yosemite Park to protect the land from who? The land that belonged to other people who had previously already occupied those spaces. And then we come to today and we look at today and this next generation. And we think about while we've made choices in life and we've made choices for survival, for freedom, We've made choices to hold on to land. We've made choices to secure land. There's also this notion of fighting for civil rights and equality. And in this image, in the black and white image at the top, you see Native people in conjunction with folks. Here we see Ralph Abernathy, civil rights leader, at the Poor People's Campaign, mounted by Martin Luther King, a campaign to fight for economic justice crossing different groups, different marginalized groups, coming together to fight for economic justice. We see the bottom image of the Black Lives Matter movement coming together at, at Standing Rock, fighting for water rights, access to water, fighting against environmental racism, fighting against industrial encroachment. The young lady, um, Ms. Miski Noor, and please excuse me while I read this to you, she is one of the leaders in the Minnesota Black Lives Matter movement. She said, water is life for all of us. As a movement, we have a duty to uplift and amplify stories and struggles of all marginalized folks as our liberation is intertwined. And so it's vastly important, while I don't see this as trying to create or, or fabricate a kumbaya moment, this is a human rights issue. And so just as the Black Lives Matter movement showed up in support of the Dakota pipeline fight against the industry and environmental racism, we also see where the Ojibwa jingle dancers came 
in support of the fight against police brutality in Minneapolis, where they came and did a ceremony at the site of the memorial that was created in honor of George Floyd and all that flowed from his murder. And so it's imperative that we always look back at our history, where we've come from, what we've gone through, but also consider that this is always a matter of choices that we make, but why we make certain choices. And at the end of the day, this is a human rights fight. And we have varying agendas, but we also have many things on our agendas that are overlapping. And it's a very powerful history. So I'm very honored to be able to share part of this history with you. I'm very honored to be part of this panel. And I can't wait to hear from the rest of our panelists. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Now I will introduce Vanielle Blackhorse, a member of the Navajo Nation, a community leader who works for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, which was established back in 1959 to address the absence of utilities on the 27,000 square miles of the Navajo Nation. She will share her family story and perspectives and her work to improve the health and welfare of residents of the Navajo Nation. Danielle? Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, my name is Vinya Blackhorse. I am 28 years old and I live here in Kansa, Arizona, which is on the Navajo Nation. So one of the things I want you to ask yourself before I start is, where was I when COVID-19 first hit? I remember I, I had a two week old baby and I was at home tending to her and my oldest daughter. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've, I've been asked to talk about my, my experience dealing with this pandemic while living on the Navajo Nation. When it all started, I thought it would go away as quickly as it came. Um, but over time, I realized that that wasn't the case. And as may, as many other people had thought, I thought I wouldn't it wouldn't affect me personally, but it did. Um, a lot of you guys know that I lost my older sister, um, Valentina Maria Blackhorse, last year in April, when COVID hit Navajo Nation really bad. Um, you guys probably saw her on. A lot of the news outlets, newspapers, and um, that's how it affected me and my family. Um, it's still hard to this day not having her around, but we are still grieving and we take it day by day. And I, I believe... Um, it spread so quickly because there's many generations living in one household. Um, take my parents' household, for example. There's my parents, me and my older sister, and our children living in the home, which is basically three generations and under one roof. And I feel like that during the pandemic that contributed to a lot of the art the outbreaks um in a way living under one roof with generations does is a good thing um our kids grew, are growing up really close with their grandparents and um i get to be with around my parents 24 7 before i go to work and when i come home from work and also i i believe that a lot of the um a lot of navajos that live here don't have running water or electricity and i feel like that also contributed to the outbreak here on navajo nation because if you don't have electricity or running water you don't know how are you supposed to wash your hands every 20 minutes with soap and water if you don't have those basic necessities at home. And, <clears throat> and another thing that I was asked to talk about is how I feel 
the president of Navajo Nation is handling the situation. Um, in my in my very own personal opinion, I feel like he has handled the pandemic pretty well um with the current lockdowns or last year when it was barely beginning he um issued those lockdowns or and also the 57 hour weekend lockdowns and there was a point where they were issuing it, it, issuing citations if you weren't at home um and then i also saw saw him out pat um giving out those food donations and he's always updating his facebook page with the latest covid-19 news and even now a year almost 2 years into the pandemic he still up to date with his Facebook with COVID news, as well as encouraging the Navajo people to get vaccinated. Um, so I'm, I was fortunate enough to live in a home that has running water and electricity. So that helped a lot during the pandemic. I went back to work during the pandemic. Um, I worked at the local Fashion supermarket um, for a while. And when I first started, I had anxiety when I would go to work because I, I have my two kids at home. At that time, we, we, there was no vac, there was no vaccination. So I was always worried about bringing something back to my kids, my nephew, my niece, and my parents, um, only because my parents do have, do both have underlying health conditions. And my kids are very young. The kids in the household are very young. And there was a point where I would always think to myself, is working right now really worth it? And there were so many days where I would think, I would think of quitting because I didn't want to bring home anything to my parents or any, or my family at that. Um, but when I was there, I kept my distance from people. I would always wear my mask. Um, and I was always like religiously using hand sanitizer when I was there. Um, and then now I work at the local NCAA office and their procedures is a lot better than where I was previously employed. And um, I'm not really directly like facing customers that come in. Um, so that was pretty much my experience in the pandemic. Um, just how it affected me and my family a lot was definitely losing my sister to the virus. And when this whole thing started, you know, she she was the main person that told us to stay home. She was the main, the main one that told us to wear masks and to sanitize her hand, wash her hand, wipe everything down when we bring it back from the grocery store. And she was careful, but she caught it. And now she's not here with us so just want to say thank you again for inviting me on to as a panelist for this um and sharing my experience um during this whole COVID-19 pandemic thank you so much Danielle I want to now introduce Raleen Ross from the Pueblo Laguna community in New Mexico Marlene is a cultural psychologist and consultant. She has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of North Dakota. She works with native communities providing mental health services and on projects related to the intersectionality of mental health and law enforcement in Indian country. 
She'll now share her perspectives and work on these topics. Marlene? Guazi Sehopa, Honorable Governor Vio, the Smithsonian Institute and esteemed colleagues, it is my privilege to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. First of all, I am Goe Kameh from Laguna. I am a mother, daughter, auntie, sister, niece, and granddaughter. I'm also a scientist practitioner as my background and doctoral education and training are in clinical psychology. As a Pueblo woman, I carry my traditional values with me wherever I go. This degree was for the purpose of fulfilling my traditional role in helping to care for our children, families, and communities. Having those letters behind my name was to have a seat at the table in affecting local, regional, state, and national law and policy. My degree was for the purpose of advocating for equity for Native people, deconstructing stigma and perpetuated stereotypes, and contributing to the health and well being of the marginalized and underserved, including those whose ancestors were enslaved. It was also for the purpose of positively contributing to current epidemics in our tribal communities, such as efforts to mitigate the outcomes of the missing and murdered Indigenous people crisis. My dialogue today centers around our narrative as presented from a Native lens. You may ask, what does that mean? That means since time immemorial, our tribal communities have had a plethora of knowledge and expertise. We have always had education as a part of our culture and upbringing, which is now gradually being acknowledged in the Western world and granted credibility. But there is much more work yet to do. Discussions and acknowledgements that intergenerational trauma as a result of hegemony, genocide, oppression, forced servitude, land and water pilferage, eugenics, sterilization, and boarding schools for language loss, cultural identity, sexual and physical abuse, and death occurred. These were sanctioned by governmental, institutional, and systemic entities and are the basis of social and medical maladies in today's Native communities. Mental health and healthcare disparities adversely impact Indigenous peoples. Of course, we know that these disparities not only result in social and medical maladies, but there are also socioeconomic, sociopolitical, and socioecological consequences that highlight persistent injustices. Many times, sociocultural and eco-psychological contextual factors are neglected in Western-based professional fields. Those can include cultural traditional knowledge, social justice factors, assimilation, marginalization, and systemic racism. Work conducted by Native professionals, including our traditional leaders, is based in interconnectedness and re relationality, which are core tribal values. The work is also driven by day-to-day -day interactions interfacing with community members, families, and children. We are changing our narrative. Today, as more Native scholars are emerging, the professional arenas and fields are balancing. Collectivistic Native traditional values and knowledge predominate the Indigenous lens and are interweaved into a Western education. I would ask you to think back to your own education. How was history told and taught in grade school? High school? The narrative was unidirectional, chronological, and told in one voice, which was not complementary to Native peoples. The mainstream narrative is incongruent with the history many of our tribal nations, our families, and the lived histories of our ancestors. For far too long, our traditional knowledge has been disregarded and ostracized and our voices unheard. Today, history is being rewritten in our own voices. Speaking from my field in psychology, the background and courses are very Western driven. There is little to no allowance for culture, language and native racial identity. So in order to make these training, education and service delivery experiences relevant to native people, Health and well being must be adapted to meet the needs of the people. It must be culturally relevant. 
For example, if I brought manualized Western-based psychology and treatment and working with a traditional Native client, the likelihood of the effectiveness is minimal. So rewriting our narrative also means it is incumbent upon the professional to meet the client where they are in their overall well-being and functioning, which is the basis of a cultural humility approach. This also includes capitalizing on the strengths of a person rather than propagating deficits. There must also be an acknowledgement that culture matters and intergenerational trauma exists in the healing journey of Native people. Professionals possessing an understanding of the significance of a holistic approach will be beneficial. This approach focuses on the importance of community and connection. Currently, work by Native scholars in a multiplicity of fields has begun to reclaim theoretical approaches, treatment methodologies, and research paradigms, thus deconstructing Western ideology as it pertains to the Native population in reconceptualization of the approaches when working with Native peoples, the relevancy to tribal popula populations in application must be informed by tribal knowledge systems and values. In addition, Western literature and treatment approaches are being contextualized within a traditional knowledge system through a cultural humility approach, courageous conversations, such as with the discussion today, must in occur in order to change our society and the trajectory of equity in our nation. Research by Native scholars as a form of self-determination have refuted ongoing stereotypes which continue to perpetuate stigma. We are now demanding that research paradigms are conducted in collaboration with us and no longer on us, which most of the historical literature reflects. Further, tribal nations are exerting our na native sovereign right to information collected about us and dictating how it can be used as we institute data sovereignty. We are now living in a world where injustice and inequality are no longer acceptable. In discussions about resilience in the native population, specifically the native population, as we have survived three governments, Spain, Mexico, and the US, they must include and acknowledge 500 plus years of survival. Our cultures and our ways of life have been our medicine. Unjust systems must be dismantled and we must work toward equity. According to the CDC, and which is a very uh, late statistic, around 6,600 American Indian and Alaska members died as a result of COVID-19 which constitutes the highest rate of any ethnic group. COVID-19 has disrupted many traditional cycles, including intimate family relationships, social interactions, and the ceremonial calendar. Thus, the loss of connectedness has had an impact. COVID-19 illuminated inequities in Native communities that existed pre-pandemic, including an underfunded broken medical system. Other inequities included some homes don't have the basic amenity infrastructure, including running water or electricity. Healthcare resources are limited and difficult to access. There are housing shortages, but this is also a positive where multi-generational families reside. It also illuminated access to education, disparities in quality of education and deficient educational systems. It also highlighted a lot of lack of broadband infrastructure for electric, electric and electronic communication for school and work. Employment, closure of casinos and tribal businesses, which were not eligible for CARES Act funding. Thus, it is time to learn and acknowledge Native American history and traverse deficit approaches towards strength-based models. For equity, we must reconceptualize unjust pathology of our Native children, families, and communities. I will close with a quote from a 2019 webinar by Dr. Donald Warren, Oglala Lakota, from the University of North Dakota. One of our challenges when we're trying to promote equity is that we also need to understand the truth. The reason we have to understand these things is that if we are ever going to get to equity, we have to walk through truth, even when it's unpleasant, even when it makes us uncomfortable, 
this is the truth of our history. And if we're going to get to the truth of the solutions, we better have a common understanding of the reality that our people face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roileen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Brandy McDonald. She is a member of the Chickasaw and Choctaw communities. She serves as director of decolonizing initiatives at the Museum of Us, and she is an active museum professional and current PhD candidate as well. Her work focuses on decolonial theory and museums center on, centered on truth-telling and actionable change to address racism and inequity. Thank you, Brandy, for sharing your expertise tonight and your experiences with us now. Thank you. Chokma, Sanofa, Brandy McDonald, Chikasasea, Chatasea. Hello, my name is Brandy McDonald, as you have, we had previously heard. Um, I am a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation with ancestral ties to the Choctaw Nation. Um, I currently uh, reside in uh, Kumeyaay territory, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Kumeyaay peoples in San Diego, California. And that's also where I work, which is the Museum of Us, uh, is in the ancestral homeland of Kumeyaay peoples. And so as you see on our building, on the slide that's pulled up, um, you can see that it is uh, a very ornate, a Spanish colonial building. Um, some people may call it beautiful uh, and people take selfies in front of it all the time. But if you look closer, you'll see nine colonizers etched into the skin of the museum. Uh, the museum and museum field was birthed from the colonial endeavor. Our museum is an example of one that was also birthed from colonialism. It's an anthropology museum that was built in 1915. It's a historic building. And so one of the things that I'm going to talk about is an example of what we are working to do, um, hoping to do, and through with our commitment to indigenous communities and par through partnership with indigenous communities globally to work on decolonizing the museum. We recognize that decolonization is not a linear process, it's not a goal at the end of a physical year or a deliverable from a grant. It's a process, it's a verb, it's an action, and it's going to take decades and may never happen. So we're decolonizing, we're actively working collectively to create fluid processes that may change in a decade. Um, and so one of the pieces of work that we recognize through guidance of indigenous and non-indigenous community members is that truth telling and accountability is the heart of the work, um, which we've heard people talk about, um, these wonderful panelists before me, talk about the importance of being accountable to colonialism and what does that look like and what does accountable action look like? And so when we think about um, the nine colonizers in the facade and the ways that we've uplifted colonialism uh, for our hundred plus years, uh, what does it mean to be honest and tell the whole truth of these nine colonizers? And so that's what we did uh, over the last year uh, in the midst of COVID. We worked with Google Arts and Culture to create an exhibit, um, which is called The Colonial Legacy, The Museum's Facade. Um, in this exhibit, we really dive into being honest that this is a historic building. And so we're really limited to what we can do with the historic building, but also recognizing that this historic building is a physical manifestation of justifying the doctrine of discovery and something that continues to perpetrate colonialism, but also uplift these nine colonizers. And so what is our responsibility? How are we as a museum and as a team and are working to decolonize? How, what is our responsibility to be accountable to that? And so in the first few, I wanna say five slides, you'll see a slide of accountability. It's recognizing and being honest that in the last hundred years of the museum's existence, it's ignored and been an erasure to indigenous peoples, specifically the Kumeyaay peoples, but indigenous communities across the world. The museum holds 75,000 ethnographic objects from indigenous populations all over the world. It holds the ancestors of indigenous peoples, 7,500 that we know of ancestors at the moment. We need to repatriate those ancestors and items back home if the community wants it home. So making sure we're accountable to that in all facets of the work we do, especially in Google Arts and Culture, and recognizing that by not telling the whole truth uh, about the colonizers on our facade, that we continue to perpetrate colonialism and uplift um, a one-sided Euro-American narrative. And what does that look like for continuing to uh, marginalize indigenous communities? And then we make a commitment that we're here to do better, um, that what is our work going forward? What does it look like? 
So when we think about the museum as a whole, we think of those nine colonizers within this exhibit, we really dive into each one of the nine men. Um, there are eight of the colonizers are from um, Spanish slash Portuguese descent. Uh, there's some debate if they're Spanish or Portuguese, a couple of folks. And then there's also one um, British colonizer, uh, George Vancouver. Um, but really looking into the ways that over the course of, uh, from the 1500s to the 1700s, over the course of a couple hundred years, the ways that their legacy um, and the amount of genocide and forced and violent assimilation and ensla indigenous enslavement built off of each other's. Even if someone was a map maker, those maps were then used to further enslaved indigenous communities, to further take land, to further capitalize off of folks. Uh, and what does that mean for the ways in which that caused harm and how it's rippled into contemporary time? And so at the very top, at the tip of um, the facade, we have um, Junipera Serra. And recognizing Junipera Serra and many of the missions that he has, you'll find in the exhibits, talk about how um, that well, they, from the missionary side, that they seem to be these beautiful, lush places in the midst of California, um, that there were other people that came in that uh, connected them to the enslaved plantations, or enslavement plantations that were in the Indies all across um, the, the triad of the, the circle of indigenous uh, and non-indigenous enslavement. Uh, so really recognizing that there are multiple truths and that we need to tell all of the truths and the ways in which that indigenous peoples uh, were unfree laborers uh, through forced assimilation. We also talk quite a bit about King Charles and the different pieces of legislations that were passed that perhaps, uh, and the ways that they supported uh, the conquistadors as well. We think about Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. In this, as you can see on this slide, this is an example of some of the diversity that you'll see in recognizing the legacy of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. This is an example of how we look at identity, place, time and the facade of showing national monuments of the Cabrillo National Monument that people actively go to through the use of uh, Google Maps. We also look at the bridge, the historic bridge, and you can see our museum real tiny there, um, but that bridge is still there and that people walk across. It is called Cabrillo Bridge. You see an image of our facade. You see the beach that people actively go to, recognizing that the beach for many indigenous communities members and non-indigenous community members or black community members, that that's a point of colonization. That's what people were stolen and kidnapped from their homelands and enslaved. And then also looking at our highway systems, the way that highway systems are named after the colonizers and uplifted. So fully recognizing these intersection points um, and how we continue to perpetrate colonial harm intentionally and unintentionally because they've become the norm of the organization and how that's tied back to our museum and our facade through these depictions of the colonizers. Um, we also talk about this in the context of recognizing that um, there were laws in place uh, by the different kings who are also on our facade that say you could not buy and sell indigenous people. And yet uh, the indigenous people, once they were indoctrinated into Christianity, then they were considered property of the church. So in essence, they were unfree laborers that were still owned by the church and could then a body could be traded for another body, not necessarily for money, but still traded as enslaved peoples. And so really recognizing the complexity, which I think also Mary talked about, the complexity of enslavement and what that looks like in terms of um, space and how um, oppression manifests uh, through different points in time. So I really think when we talk about what is the responsibility of museums, um, at least from where we sit in the world and recognizing kind of the, through consultation with indigenous communities and non-indigenous community members is what does it mean to be accountable? What does it mean to be truth telling? How do we continue to work towards redressing colonial harm? And this is one example through Google Arts and Culture that we were able to leverage our partnership with Google to build a platform to be accountable to the facade um, and then see what does that mean in terms of education curriculum to build from that. Um, thank you. Brandy, thank you so much. Let's come all back together now uh, and thank you all all of the panelists for your contributions today and your powerful presentations. It's time for us to come together for discussion, something I've been looking forward to all afternoon. I hope you have some questions for each other. I certainly have a few questions in mind uh, to ask e each of you, but hopefully all panelists will consider the answers and think about next questions uh, to be asked. When preparing for this, I thought a lot about um, the opening remarks 
from Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch, the remarks that he is giving at the beginning of the virtual symposium. He points out that we cannot understand the history of this nation without understanding the history of the enslavement of indigenous people. This history is underexamined, it's underreported, uh, and as your presentations showed today, um, there is such resilience in communities, despite the trauma, the violence, and the separation. We at Smithsonian have been thinking about how we can help more with the truth-telling. Sessions like this, this first symposium, is a way for us to try to do something more than we've ever done before multiple units of Smithsonian coming together, um, bringing, um, I think it's more than something, 30 panelists together over six sessions to talk about this. And again, a first step, a step that we need to be committed to as an institution, and I believe we will with our leaders who we have today. But it's been so inspiring to hear all of you, and I want to listen and I want our staffs at the institution to be able to hopefully begin to continue the relationships with all of you to think about next steps in programming and uh, how we put together exhibitions and how we really think about moving um, the understanding of this very hard and complicated history uh, throughout what is now the United States moving forward. So I think we should start talking uh, between each other and amongst each other now because um, hearing all of your knowledge and all of the history that you bring to the session, um, I just I want to point out, you know, Vanielle talked about it, but all of you talked about COVID and the current impact of the COVID pandemic. It's been devastating across American Indian country and, in, and throughout indigenous communities um, all across the Western Hemisphere. Um, the story of the loss of Danielle's sister, we saw in the media, we heard from her today, this heartbreaking um, story of loss for one family, uh, indicative of Navajo Nation, um, and, and something that we don't want to see happen to anyone. Um, how has the recent health crisis challenged Navajo Nation, Danielle, but also, um, are there encouraging new efforts? Are there something positive that can come from such loss? Um, we're talking about the legacies of slavery here, and we're hopefully also considering new resources and how we can all come together to support communities and, and, and share these stories um, more in that effort to make things better for the future. So, Vanya, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that as we start this conversation. Did you? Um, I see a lot of effort now. Um, for a while, there was, you know, outside doctors and um, military personnel that came in and really helped Navajo Nation, um, especially when we were one of the ha hardest hit nations uh, in the United States. At one point, we were, you know, the highest infection rate per capita. And when that happened, <clears throat> a lot of outside help came. Um, and it was really good to see a lot of help out from outside of the Navajo Nation to come in and help. And um, people donating things. Um, and I feel like in a way it shined a lot of light on a lot of American Indian, a lot of how American Indian struggles with you no know, electricity, um, you know, the groups of family living together. And I feel like it brought a lot of media attention to that, to where hopefully in the future that you know, um, a lot of those things will change. And that's my only hope is in the future that a lot of those things do change. And um, yeah, so that's my only hope is things will change for a lot of American Indian nations. 
Governor, would you like to say anything about, about your community and response to what Vanielle said or just from your own perspective? Uh, sure, thank you very much. You know, at the very onset, uh, when the first case was reported in the state of New Mexico, um, I issued a uh, state of emergency, declaration of emergency, and um, three days later issued an executive order uh, basically closing the Pueblo. Um, and that executive order remains in effect even today. Our borders remain uh, monitored um, with limited access of both tribal members and non-tribal members on and off our, our reservation. And <clears throat> I think that um, the community coming together and understanding the rationale for having to do this was uh, a blessing uh, because I think we all recognize that there is so much at stake. And even while we uh, took the, that level of precaution, um, COVID did enter. And um, we have had a total of 424 tribal members from an on-reservation population of about 3,700. The total ACMA uh, tribal population is 5,100. Um, and sadly, um, experience the loss of 23 tribal members. I, I, I don't know how we recover from that. But I do know that um, even while we could not grieve together, as family, extended family and community. I was so just filled with great respect and um, love for my people that even when they could not come together to grieve, They relied on cultural, culture, cultural values of the Akama people to get them through. It was one of the most difficult things to observe, but it, it was very telling of the resilience of my people. And it's what's gotten us through. And, and, and we, I suppose that, you know, even while we will maintain the closure of the Pueblo, likely, you know, through the end of this year, we understand the need to have taken those measures. Tomorrow, tomorrow will be the very first time since March of last year that our community will come together for a cultural observance. And even while the, the um, environment for that event is going to be very different from what we would normally experience, it will bring community together. And we've all been praying for this day to arrive. So the the strength in our people, in our indigenous peoples, was so profound during this, this time. Even in the most dire and difficult times, we, 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 we rose to the next day, praying for a better day. And not only praying for our own community, but in the spirit of being an indigenous person, extending those prayers beyond to all of humanity. And as I said earlier in, in, in my presentation, that is going to be, that's, that's where the power lies in change uh, and, and in the future of our, of our community. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you so much, Governor. 
Arlene, I want to turn to you for a minute because, you know, we've spent um, a while this afternoon talking about trauma, talking about the legacies of Indian bondage uh, and all that that entails. And now we're dealing with the devastation of COVID, another uh, pandemic that we were not ready for, uh, but was upon us. The loss of family members, the loss of elders is, is so... Um, intense uh, and um, and hard to rebound from. But we've talked about that word resilience. And in your work, um, what would you like to say in, in response to uh, the, the COVID pandemic in particular and what our country has gone through with dual pandemics uh, of, of COVID and also uh, racial uh, injustice? Um, from your perspectives, um, how can we move forward and how will you be looking on some of your projects to help communities through this? When the pandemic hit, I was actually in Nome, Alaska, serving the Alaska Native population. Um, I moved back to New Mexico in October of 2020. So I've been home for about nine months. But in Alaska, uh, they shut down the borders much like in Acoma Pueblo much like in Laguna Pueblo, we closed our, we asserted our sovereignty and closed access from outsiders into our communities, as well as our community members not being able to, to leave. Um, with regard to moving forward, there's been an increase in individuals accessing behavioral health services. And in fact, uh, at this time, I know that there are wait lists um, far greater in number than had been pre-pandemic for people to work through some of these, um, work through some of the feelings, some of the depression that's been experienced, the anxiety. Those are natural responses to the fear that we experienced, the fear of going out in public and getting COVID, the fear of going out in public because of the civil unrest in our country. And the two of those combined created a situation where some people who may not have reached out for services are doing that now. With regard to the native population, that combined with intergenerational trauma, that combined with the trauma that occurred with COVID, the, the trauma that occurred with the civil unrest in our country, those responses by individuals are very, very natural responses, physical responses, cognitive responses. And so I emphasized in my presentation the need in working with Native communities, the need to include tribal values, to include relationality, to include connectedness, to include those values because we have been subjected to so many different approaches by the outside that have come in and into our tribal communities. And those have not worked because we haven't asked the tribal communities, what do you need? How can we do this? And so that might be something I'm going to shift here for a second to say that would be one thing that the museum could assist with is that voice, elevating the voice of our tribal communities and honoring the voices and the knowledge that exists there. Governor Vile, do you have anything to add to that, please? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ross. That's, that's an important point um, that not only the Smithsonian Inst Institution as a whole, um, but other cultural, similar cultural institutions who are engaged already in some level of this work. Uh, it was happening and thankfully there was a movement that was um, uh, occurring pre-pandemic uh, that was, you know, engaging uh, museums with, with uh, descendant communities um, and, and indigenous peoples to really begin to think about how you deconstruct that colonial 
um, construct <laughs> and, um, you know, work toward changing narrative, but also then bringing it to present day and um, exploring ways that we empower and provide every opportunity for Indigenous peoples to be engaged in, in a process um, of education um, and exposure of issues to the public at large. So I think that, uh, you know, I agree with uh, what was just stated, and uh, I hope to, to see that this movement uh, picks up from where it left off, you know, uh, pre-pandemic. And I know there was a little bit of work that happened during the, during the pandemic and last year, but there's still much to do. And as uh, one of the, the other presenter, I'm sorry, I don't recall her name right now, but uh, who, who's from uh, Choctaw and um, Chickasaw, Repatriation of, of uh, ancestors is just so, so important. That in itself is healing. It's a profound way to heal. And um, if we can facilitate more of that in a meaningful and, and culturally sensitive way, there is plenty of room then for, for um, deconstruction and um, changing narrative and empowering, empowering, it's a difficult word, um, our Native people. Thank you, Governor. Um, I am just continue to learn so much in my role uh, at the National Museum of American Indian. And if we could all learn more from the healing traditions of Native communities, I think our country will benefit so much. Um, one legacy of Indian bondage that... Um, uh, remained strong and was represented uh, in, in the recent reports of the discovered bodies of the First Nation children in Canada at the former boarding schools. Um, and also a legacy, the, the recent return of the remains of nine children who died while at Carlisle School in Pennsylvania to their Lakota community uh, in Ro and the Rosebud Reservation just last weekend. Um, I'm hoping that these new initiatives, in addition to what Brandy and so many others have been doing with repatriation in our museums, um, will will start some new national conversations. And I think one of one of our leaders. Not, not only do we have our own Kevin Gover moving from our director at the National Museum to undersecretary of all content at the Smithsonian, but we have Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland. Um, starting new task force, looking for reporting now on um, the boarding schools in the U.S. Um, so long overdue, and now at least for these four years, if not longer, hopefully, um, we have someone who will be um, pursuing these truths that we talked about this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I hope um, that these national conversations will grow. Um, I know we're thinking about how um, to be a part of that. Uh, and, I, you know, Brandy, do you have something you want to um, talk further about, about your work at the Museum of Us? Yes, thank you. Yes, I, um, repatriation, I, I'm so happy that, um, thank you, Governor, and, and thank you um, for mentioning that, because I just, and I think that the ancestors are stolen. They should never be in museums. They need to go home. Uh, if the community wants them home, they need to be stored and taken care of, right? Like, that's same thing with, I believe, with our the cultural resources that are in so many museums. Um, they are community's connection to our past, present, and our future. And so what does it look like for these items, these, these belongings, to have been taken and stolen from their homelands, from their people, and be disconnected? It, in, in that way and not cared for. And so I think um, when we think about repatriation, that's one of the, what we're talking at the museum is recognizing that repatriation is more than just the items that are covered under NAGPRA and repatriation and communities should be all connected to their cultural resources and ancestors, not just federally recognized community members within the, the imperial borders of the US. And so we are really serious in terms of the context of what policy and practice and the ways in which policy and practice create systemic change to create um, organizational culture shifts within the field. And so that's where we see our policies around colonial pathways policy that applies to all of our cultural resources that's an international footprint. And so what does it look like to repatriate internationally, um, to build from the work of NAGPRA 
and apply some of those flat practices, but recognizing that there's a lot of practices that don't work with NAGPRA, where NAGPRA is not the ceiling, it's the floor that we build off from. What does it look like? How do we partner with other communities and to build policies around the repatriation of enslaved community members, um, of any community, enslaved community members within the imperial borders and beyond the imperial borders of the U.S.? Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we really talk about when we think about decolonial practices, but just and think about museums future. I also think in terms of you asked about the pandemic and just really quickly, one of the things that we really pushed, um, we talk about policy and culture change, but we really looked at bereavement practices and the policy of bereavement practices and this construct, this colonial construct of what is family, that it's a family and your children or just the parental units or what is defined as, but family within many communities outside of this Euro-American ideology extends one parent and, and your children, right? Or your, your partner. And so we've written policies and rewritten policies to make sure that we are recognizing what that looks like and how bereavement is longer than maybe two days. Maybe it is a week because there needs to be a wait, but what does that look like to make sure that we are consistently pushing? We also are repat we repatriated in the midst of COVID and working collectively with community members through Zoom <laughs> and making sure that we are following protocol. And what does communication look like? So we're asking, can we pick this up? What are the gender protocols? How do you want us to do the XRF testings where you take the laser and make sure that, you know, there's not any radiation or there's not any chemicals or mercury or arsenic. Um, but we've been working with indigenous communities on their time through their direction to make sure that we can continue to repatriate um, ancestors, repatriate items, both under NAGPRA and colonial pathways. And so I think that there's, COVID is hard, but there are ways for us to continue to do this work and work with indigenous communities and recognize their right to self-determination and to sovereignty, um, even in the midst of these really big challenges. What it does is it makes us expand because we've always been stuck as, well, this is what we've always done. Who says that? It needs to, it's like the museums can be so much more. Who has defined what is the norm of a museum? And typically it's through a colonial construct. And the National Museum, thank you so much, Brendan. The National Museum also continued to repatriate uh, to communities, um, you know, through virtual engagements and then actually having some physical transfers recently. So thank you for, for what you've done uh, at your museum and, and moving forward. And, and Mary, I, w I wanted to talk a little bit about your research. I know you um, lead uh, a center for the study of global slavery. Um, so just as we have a little bit of time, I want to make sure we get uh, to everybody and think if there, think all of you if there's some extra questions. But Mary, how do you foresee research on the other slavery and what we've been talking about this afternoon for the legacy of Indian bondage impacting your work at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, has, well, has the exploration of this broadened your knowledge, your awareness on the question of slavery in the US? Yes, it has, and thank you for that question. And my mind is reeling with so many things I wanna share, but I do wanna speak to what was just discussed because I want to share that I had the pleasure of um, serving as a panelist um, for a panel called the Archaeology of Redress and Restorative Justice. That same group that hosted that panel hosted another panel called Reclaiming the Ancestors, Indigenous and Black Perspectives on Repatriation, Human Rights, and Justice. And the host organization for that, and it's important for everyone to know this, is a collective of the Wintergren Foundation, Anthropological Research, Sapiens, the Society of Black Archaeologists, um, Indigenous Archaeology Collective, Peabody Institute of Archaeology, Cornell Institute of Archaeology and Material Studies. And so I wanted to share that because um, it's important at this time that we're dealing with quarantine, we've all kind of been forced on a forced march to engage digitally. And so by doing so, we've had these opportunities to have conversations on the digital platform, exposing these topics to broader audiences. I think in the panel that I served on, we had about 1,500 people who tuned in. And it's imperative for programs like this that it's not just practitioners, it's not just scholars, it's lay people who are educating themselves on these very, very important topics so they can be thoughtful moving forward and 
work collaboratively on some of these social justice issues. So I just wanted to address that with you to let you know that there are some other groups out there that are doing this work as well with the lens, using the lens of archaeology. So I wanted to just share that with you all. Um, and as for me, you know, I have the pleasure of serving as the curator of American slavery at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. My colleague, um, Paul Gardulo is over the Center for the Study of Global Slavery. And what's really powerful about that um, is there's an initiative underway there with the, um, it is the um, Global Curatorial Project, which brings together curators from across the world to look at this history of bondage of slavery throughout the world. And it's also um, the Slave Rex Project, which looks at slavery not only within um, you know, North America, but also looking at it within the US, but also looking at it in the Caribbean and all over through the lens of maritime archeology. span And so we aren't limited to looking at this history through slave shipwrecks, but also looking at it through terrestrial archeology. span And in doing so, we look at sites, for example, like St. Croix, where we look at the archeology span that was done with um, the history of the Taino community, as well as the history of enslaved people of African descent in St. Croix, right? And in that um, former Danish West Indies region. And it really informs us about where groups crossed over, where they interfaced, um, and also how people repurposed materials that they found in maroon communities. Um, it really helps us think more about forms of um, people seeking freedom and um, what bondage, how bondage um, played out in many different ways. And I think about in terms of U.S. slavery, in the, in the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we talk about this is a human story, it's a shared history, and we look at the American story through the African American lens. I always tell everyone that lens looked out onto a world that included enslaved people of African descent, free people of color, native people, poor white people, yeoman white farmers, and planter elite. So when we tell this story, we can't leave anyone out because everyone, everything was impacted. Anything that happened with native people, we look, it informs us, Michelle, about, okay, why was a certain law created? Someone had mentioned earlier about the limits of freedom and these laws that are foundational to this nation were steeped in slavery, steeped in bondage, not just control of people of African descent, but control of people who are native people, as well as control of status in terms of economic status, like I mentioned, poor white people, yeoman white farmers. And so when we placed the laws on the walls in colonial North America, we didn't just include the laws that were specific to bondage of African people. We included the laws that spoke directly to the experiences of native people. And when we show the differences in the regional experiences, because we said this is not a monolithic experience of enslavement once people came into the area, it depended on the landscape and so many other things, the different, co the different nation states that had colonized the area. We look at the intersections of both Native American and people of African descent. What it does for me now, thinking about other forms of slavery, I think of a play on the word other, and I think of it in the sense of othering, and othering to marginalize groups of people and to understand why, why, how, how did the enslavement of native people impact the enslavement of people of African descent? And how was a system designed based on control of these two groups, not just one, but two groups? And so that lens is through an African-American lens, but we can't have a very narrow focus. We have to look alongside all of these different forms of bondage and how certain laws and certain um, societal practices were based on control of these two groups. That's one of the things I think about. Thank you so much, Mary. 
And thank you to all of our panelists. I think widening that lens, thinking about the impact of Native American and indigenous slavery and bondage and peonage in the broadest cultural concepts uh, and collaborating with individuals like you and Paul, Mary, at the African American Museum, broadening how the National Museum of American Indian looks at Indian slavery and, and partners with communities and cultural centers. Um, we, we've got a long way to go, um, but we're committed to this. And hopefully this first virtual symposium will kick off many years of collaborations with all of you. I thank you for your time this afternoon. I thank you for your expertise, your perspectives, your own incredible stories that you've shared with us this afternoon. And we look forward to talking again. Thanks so much to all of you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.